Hello, everybody. Okay. Let me, I just sat down, so let me sort of get situated. Okay. It looks like we already have a guest in the green room. So let me get uh, some uh, housekeeping out of the way here. Uh, so I'm back. I think I took two weeks off from live streaming because I was very, very, very focused on uh, finishing the drawing of D vs. M 1979, my third entry in the D vs. M series, uh, by the end of March. It was a personal goal. I'm the boss of me, so the goal could be any time. It could be the summer, it could be by next Christmas, it could be whatever, but I was just hell-bent on I want it done in March, just because. Um, so I felt like I was not in danger of, I, I, I guess, mild danger of missing it. I wasn't too worried about it, but it was just going to get a little tight, and I didn't like that feeling. And uh, more than anything else, I just kind of wanted to concentrate on my process at the end rather than divide my attention which if you've watched me for any length of time, you know, is a recurring theme with me. I'm very um, intense, for lack of a better word, about my process. And I'm especially protective of my headspace when I'm in it. And anytime I feel like, oh, this isn't feeling right, or oh, I'm distracted, or oh, I'm thinking about this or that and not the work or whatever, I kind of hit the reset button and like, what? What's going on? Because I, I never let that go more than a week or two. Partly because of just magical thinking. Like I just feel like no good work can come out of a head that is not focused and clear about what you're doing, which may or may not be true. Probably not true, but that's how I feel. And then also just because, again, at the end of the day, the most important thing to me with Diva Sim is that I'm enjoying it. I have to be enjoying writing, planning, drawing, and putting out these books. Uh, anything else, money that gets made, how many followers or likes I have, what people think of it, like all, all that, like what cons am I going to, how did I do at the con, that all is low on my list of priorities like I really I, I I my idea I of course I care about that stuff but my ideal would be that I just do not give a shit about any of that that it's purely processed that it's purely a joyful fulfilling interesting re uh, revelatory experience for me to be making art end of sentence like and so i always kind of go back to that first principle of like anytime i'm doing something and i'm feeling eh, it's not feeling right i kind of want to diagnose that before i go too far down the path thus i the point of this being a few weeks ago i was going into that i think i was overwhelmed with like oh my gosh i'm going to finish and oh my gosh there's only a page or two left and uh boy i'd really like to be done in march because i'd really like to have the comic for sale maybe in April and uh, it's getting tight and I'm stressed about getting tight. Now I'm thinking about that and I'm not thinking about the page I need to draw. It, and it's just, uh, and so I felt like I need to simplify. I need to simplify and, and strip away all this stuff that's, you know, muddling me and focus on the work. Anyway, the last page is drawn. We're gonna talk a lot about that today. But first, because I've been away, we're going to talk three books from the library. So um, I tried to, again, pick just a random. There's no rhyme or reason or message to any of this. I just, three books that I thought, you know, sort of represent all these books behind me and then more books that are off in the living room and all that. Uh, right now, I'm almost done with, you can kind of see where I'm at with it. 
uh, David Milch's memoir, uh, Life's Work. If you're unfamiliar, David Milch is a TV writer. He was uh, a writer on Hill Street Blues way back in the day. He was one of the primary and eventually like the guy behind NYPD Blue. But what especially endears him to me was that he was the creator and writer, main writer behind Deadwood, which is, I don't want to spoil any future top fives about cable TV shows. Suffice it to say, Deadwood will feature on my top five. Deadwood is just, I, I adore Deadwood. I love it so much. I think, and mostly on the basis of the writing, which I think is incredible incredible just complete i i and i don't use that word lightly just amazing i was really thrilled uh the other night when i was on uh josh temple's channel guest hosting art casters i don't think this was on air i think it was just before we went live paul pate mentioned that he was starting deadwood and i was you i got that thrill of like someone's reading the book that you love or someone seeing the movie that you love or whatever i was like oh my god somebody's watching deadwood i'm so excited for you anyway um i just picked this up recently as much of a fan of milch as i am i just picked this up recently because i just learned a few months ago that he has been battling alzheimer's which to me is just especially sad and cruel that I, you know, a guy who I think is just a genius, a guy who's made his career doing some of the best writing I've read in any format, TV, books, plays, anything, that he has Alzheimer's is just like especially cruel. Like just, I mean, it, look, Alzheimer's is, a nightmarish thing like that's one of the big boogeyman diseases as far as i'm concerned but there's this extra level of like what it's like when an olympic athlete dies of a heart attack it's like what, what? Like that's him alzheimer's oh it's the worst so anyway i was catching up on him to see like what's going on with that and how is he doing and i hadn't even realized he had written a book so i picked it up Obviously, it's a memoir. Uh, I will say this about it. First of all, it's great. It's really, really, really interesting reading. Apparently, it's like, how does someone with Alzheimer's write a book? Uh, apparently, he got a lot of help from his wife and family, his grown kids. But also, I guess he's done a lot of just basically video diaries and video audio, like audio uh, recorded diaries his whole life. So they were able to go back to that and fill in gaps that he's a little fuzzy on now. Um, it's really great. This doesn't spoil anything, but I will say the guy's in his late seventies now, I think that he even got old enough to get Alzheimer's is sort of incredible because his youth, I mean, he, he comes clearly comes from one of these old school, out of control writer uh, traditions where no drug was off limits, where he was drinking entirely too much. He was gambling. He was just like, and not just like, oh, you know, weed, a little bit of coke. No, like heroin. And like, there's a story in here about like how he was high on LSD and was like walking down the street shooting a shotgun at cars. Like this guy, that he's even, again, alive long enough to get Alzheimer's, it's like, it's still a pretty good run. <laughs> it's not, I mean, he, he had a lot of good die rolls in his life. Anyway, he's a genius. The book is very interesting. If you've not seen Deadwood, watch Deadwood. Again, not to spoil a future top five. If you don't want to spoil a future top five, mute for the next five seconds. Maybe the best TV show that's ever been on the air. I don't know. You know. Anyway, lots of fun. Almost done. Uh, I I just got through his whole story about doing Deadwood, 
And now I'm curious. Now I'm assuming the last part of it is probably going to be his mounting health things and diagnosis and stuff like that. I don't know, but we'll see. I intend to finish this probably this weekend. Okay, that's book one. Book two, this is one I've talked about in previous streams. This is going to be hard to hoist. Um, this is this monster, which is it's just a huge, the only reason I haven't showed it off before is because it's a huge pain in the ass to fish out of the bookshelf. This is a book collecting all of Stanley Kubrick's unused uh, prep and research and materials for his Napoleon movie, which he never did. Um, let me just show you. It's got storyboards, it's got historical uh, references he pulled, it's got some like sketches of concept, uh, costume designs, it's got sketches of potential sets, it's uh, got versions, I think, I don't know if I said this or not, uh, versions of the screenplay, uh, yeah, costume tests, um, it's let's see here. I want to see if a lot of this is framed in a funny way if there's a really striking page. Interviews, conversations he was having with other creators about how he was going to do this and what his thoughts were and how he wanted to make it. I mean, it's just this monster, and it's, it's. I think, so why do I have this thing? Like, I don't particularly care about Napoleon. I am a big fan of Stanley Kubrick. Um, I am fascinated with what might have been projects. One of my favorite documentaries is uh, Jodorowsky's Dune. Um, this is sort of in that vein where it's this thing that was almost ready to go they had gotten all their ducks in a row they had done all their work like prep they were they were, it, this was going to happen and then it did not and uh i don't know why that's interesting to me maybe i don't even need to analyze it um it's just interesting to me there's also now to be fair talking about for example jodorowsky's dune or kubrick's napoleon or when you read about like the original plan for Star Wars Episode Nine, or wh whatever. Like anytime you read any of this stuff, they all, I'm aware uh, that they all benefit from the eternal sunshine of an undone thing. That uh, all ideas are great <laughs> and can seem like, yeah, that could be really awesome. That could be really awesome before you actually start making it. Like, proof is in the execution. Like, there's lots of great ideas out there. Uh, would, would Jodorowsky's Dune have been a great movie? I mean, it's a fascinating documentary to watch. It's fascinating ideas. And would it have been, like, a, an interesting movie? Would it have probably been a cult classic today that we were still talking about? Okay, I'll go along with that. Would it have been good? Mm, I don't know. I don't know. Same with this. Like, would this have been good? Like, I, I don't know. It would have been a Kubrick movie. It would have been interesting. It would have been, you know, good in ways. But I think maybe that's part of what's interesting to me is this idea of like, you know, if you sh a lot of people, they see this and they're like, what a tragedy. It never got made. They see Jodorowsky's Dune, Jodorowsky's, I don't know how you do his name. I'm assuming he's Argentinian, right? doesn't matter whatever you know who i'm talking about would that have been like some people are, oh why didn't we get that one why didn't we get david lynch's weird dune you know it might have actually been an amazing expensive failure and if lynch's dune had not been made people today would be saying like can you imagine how awesome a david lynch dune would have been it would have been a me oh it would have been a masterpiece wow i can't believe we never got a david lynch dune 
Well, we did get a David Lynch tune, and it was weird. Okay, so like I, but I just kind of enjoy like the what if I think. And anyway, this is one of those what if things. This massive. Thing. Okay, one more. Uh, Jesus, that's heavy. Speaking of Jesus, historical figure of Jesus. Okay, so the reason I have this book is, uh, so I, I'm not practicing anything, but I was raised Catholic. And uh, I've always been sort of academically like interested in religion, faiths, myth, all that stuff, folklore. Uh, I was very interested in Joseph Campbell. I was very interested in Houston Smith, if you're familiar with that one. He's also really, really fascinating, a good popular comparative religion writer. He's long since dead now, but uh, he's done, he did some interviews with Bill Moyers. Very interesting. Uh, I was very interested in all of that. By the time I got interested enough that by the time I got to college, I, I was majoring in anthropology and minoring in comparative religion. It was, the, their line was religious studies, but comparative religion. So all my minor classes were just seminars on Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, like what, like all Judaism, like all these different things. I was just focusing, spending semesters, a semester or semesters on different religions. And I think that actually, I think a lot of people raised with religion have this experience of you sort of develop a disinterest in it because it's just everywhere all the time. Like I was going to Catholic schools, I was going to church once a week. I was, you know, I, I felt like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to learn about Buddhism and Hinduism and other things now. And in getting academically interested in just world religions that kind of brought me back to like, okay, now I have started to have an academic interest in this, this thing I was raised with that I had never thought of in that way. Like it would, because it was endemic, I guess, if that's the right word. Like I was a fish in the ocean. I didn't really think about the water. And then I crawled on land for a little bit and was like, wow, the water was weird. Right. So then I like, I was kind of curious. So anyway, but when I circled back to it, I was more interested in the aspect that I didn't get from Catholic schools. Catholic school, you get, and I don't mean this word in a pejorative way, but you'll understand what I mean, the myth of Christianity. I was more interested, once I got to college, in the uh, historical uh, study of it. I wanted to kind of like, well, what? Like, let's get back to basics. Like, what was the early, well, first of all, what was Judea like around the time of Jesus? What was the, what was, what do we know about Jesus historically? What was the earliest Christian movement like? What was the difference between, you know, the, the, the early Christians that were represented by Peter, and um, James and stuff like that in back in Palestine and uh, Paul traveling around, basically spreading it to Gentiles. Like I was like, what, what is that all about? And like, so, and this was my, this was sort of like baby's first historical Jesus book, which is how I would present it if someone's interested in that topic. That said, it's not, it's not like a, you know, historical Jesus for dummies book. Like it is written by a real academic, E.P. Sanders is a real academic and he's a very thoughtful guy. It's a very good book, but it's also not, you know, this isn't jumping into the deep end. It just sort of walks you through, like gives you some sort of a picture of that era historically, who the main players were, what, how that all worked back then trying to compare and contrast the different gospels, trying to get at what probably we can say confidently about the historical figure that was there in that time and what he was preaching. And, you know, like it's trying to get back to like, let's try and, you know, what, what can we with some confidence say about what was going on during that time? It's really interesting. Okay, there's my three books. Now, I'm gonna catch up on the chat and I'm probably gonna very, very quickly for the guests in the green room, uh, get through what's going on with E versus M1979, and then I'm gonna let people in. So let's see here, what's uh, we got. Thank you, Jim, sip of coffee. 
from Chase, quickly swinging by to express my congratulations. Must be a relief to finally enjoy reading other books. Yes. Yes. Yeah, just the fact that I'm able to read that David Milch book right now is weird. Weird and great. Just to be able to, like, I'm going to read tonight. Because what I've been doing most nights for 60 weeks or something is drawing. And it's been nice to have a break. Howdy, how's it going? Uh, it, it is me. Yeah, well, it's it's very cool. It's very interesting. And it's always just kind of like the Jodorowsky thing. I'm assuming you're talking about the Kubrick book. It's fascinating how far something can go down a path and still not happen. Um, and I think that's the other thing that this, this, the Kubrick Napoleon movie and the Jodorowsky's Dune have in common where it's like, wow, you would think if it had gone this far, there'd be no stopping. Like now it's got a momentum and it's so clean. It's almost easier just to do it than to just say, nah, never mind. But not nah, never mind can happen. Barry Lyndon is my all-time favorite Kubrick film. So I would love to see him go all out with a staggering historical. It would have been probably fascinating. Honestly, I have a higher confidence in a Kubrick Napoleon movie than Jodorowsky's Dune. Even though I love that documentary, the Dune documentary. Like it just is the most incredible. It's it's so great. It's so great. But if I'm being honest, look, I've seen his other movies. I'm not confident that I think that would have been a spectacular disaster. But I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Um, yes. So do I, as do I, obviously. Uh, Spielberg is producing a Napoleon. Yes. 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 Spielberg, like, he also picked up the end of AI, right? I forgot where that handoff actually was. I don't, Kubrick didn't direct any of AI, right? It was all Spielberg, but that was maybe a project that Kubrick had been developing up to his death. And I don't know. I don't remember how that handoff worked. Yeah. Yeah. I think, well, and especially wasn't his initial pitch, something like oh, the movie's going to be eight hours long or six hours long or something crazy. I, okay. You know, I also can see that too. Yeah. I like that the academic book isn't over. No, it's very, very, it's like, that's why I say like, and I don't mean this in a, a derisive or dismissive way. It's very much like baby's first historical Jesus book. It's a very, just kind of, it'll give you like a whole feel. And then I do have fatter books on the subject back there that are more like, okay, now if you're ready to jump in to the deep end, like you can check out like John Dominic uh, Croissant. I don't, I don't remember if you pronounce his name Croissant or Crossane, but he's someone who's written a lot of books on the, on the subject. Thank you, Christopher. Okay, so the very quick summary, and then we'll see if some people want to join. Um, by the way, if anyone in the chat would like to join, uh, you can reach out to me on Facebook for the link, no obligation, but I've got two guests lined up. Um, so, finish drawing the last page. For the past, my, this has always been my move with every D versus M. I finish the last page and I do my best to this, this is the, this is D versus M 1979, not look at it. I print up, I test print the last page. I look at it to make sure it printed right, which I do with every page. Put it in my, you know, sheets. And just don't look. I don't want to look at it. For at least a week. That's the rule. So Monday evening, my, after my day job on Monday, I am allowed to sit down with some post-it notes and a pen and start with page one and do my best to, it's, there's usually two read-throughs. One read-through is trying to pretend this isn't my book, that I'm just reading it. 
you know, just to see like, how is this like, you know, try and take a step back. This is part of why I'm leaving it alone for a week to try and get some distance. In a perfect world, I would take six months, you know, and just set it like throw it, like throw it away. <laughs> and just like, ah, I don't know. And then maybe after, you know, that much time come back and with real distance from it. I don't, I, I would like to get this print order, the, the print order placed this month in April. So I'm not going to take a month or six months or whatever. I'm going to take a week, which is about what I normally do. One read through is trying to do it just as like anonymous audience member. Another read through is like reading, like proofreading, really like word for word, like sound, like talking it out loud, like really slowing myself down and reading it because I, I have a strict no typo policy <laughs> with my books. I absolutely not, not on my watch. And knock on wood, 75 and 97 were clean. 79 is going to be clean as well. So going through very, very meticulously and doing all the tricks to catch typos, reading it upside down, reading it in a mirror, speaking it out loud, like all the shit you do to make sure like, oh, wait a minute, I just realized those two words don't have a space between them. Or I juxtapose those letters. Or, oh, I edited this dialogue bubble when I was drawing, deleted some words, added some new ones, and forgot that there's another word earlier in the sentence that kind of references those words that I deleted. Like all that stuff, you know, all the things that can happen, all the introduced errors you can do by trying to fix something. I'm going to be looking for all that. I'm also going to be looking for, so that's just the story, like written things I'll be looking for. I'll also be looking for drawing problems. Um, why is that line so heavy? Oh, I forgot to draw the watch on that character's wrist. Oh, the, you know, I drew that person's hair like this, like, but I would never make a mistake like this, but their part was on the left for all these pages, but this one panel, their part is on the right. Like things like that. I'm just, is there anything here that is just wrong? No, I'm not looking so much for, eh, could I draw that better? If I do that, if I indulge in, could I draw that better? That can very quickly become a book that's never, ever, ever going to come out because you could always draw it better. Like it's, So there's, there's a sense of, is it, for, is it wrong? Missing something or I added something that shouldn't have been there or I, it doesn't match how we've, like it's there's a lack of continuity there's some visual problem okay that gets fixed next kind of thing that would get fixed is basic kind of design problems or visual art problems is there a tangent is there a is this unclear like is this bleeding into the background do i need to add a heavier outline or less of an outline like is it just not legible because of choices i made and then maybe if I see something where it's like, it's not just that I could do it better, but the drawing I did is bad. <laughs> you know, like I just, that hand looks weird. I can do that hand better. That foot doesn't look right. She, like the, the person standing in a, like that just doesn't look right. Like my life drawing Kung Fu was not righteous when I drew this panel. Like it just didn't work out. And I maybe, it's, it's not just not my best, it's, in my opinion, bad. That's something that maybe I would fix. But I'm not in the job of trying to make everything perfect. And in fact, I've printed a thing and put it on my monitor. Done is better than perfect. Like, perfect is... Perfect is the enemy of good, perfect is the enemy of done, perfect is the, like, perfect is actually, I'll do a video someday about the problem of perfectionism. I'm after refinement. I'm not after perfection. I'm after refinement. How can I do this better? I'm not trying to attain some impossible ideal that I can imagine in my head that's not actually possible to be, it's, it's kind of like, Kubrick's Napoleon or Jodorowsky's Dune. Like, it's very easy to think like, wow, it could have been great. Like, that's uh, like it's not a helpful thought. 
what can it be? What what can it be by the end of the month? That's that's kind of what I'll be oriented towards. All right, so that starts next week. Historically, that has never taken me very much time. I usually can do pretty thorough read-throughs and come up with a list of changes I need to make in a couple days. Uh, I may recruit somebody to be a second set of eyes, or may not. I don't know. I will, I'll see how it's going. Um, but yes, I'll be able to come up with all the things I need to fix, any potential grammar, typo issues, any potential drawing things I need to do within a couple days, and I'll probably be able to implement all those changes within a couple days. It never takes long. I always imagine, like, I'll see my change list, and I'll be like, ugh, this is going to be weeks, and it's, it's not. I mean, you're going in, like, for example, I know this one has missing watches. Sometimes a character has a watch, sometimes they don't. I'm going in and adding watches where they, that takes a second. That's really not, I mean, not a second. It'll probably take me, you know, 10 minutes every time I have to add a watch. But I'm not going to have to add a thousand watches. I'm probably going to have to add like 15. So like, again, this is very, it's not going to take super long. Um, then my attention will turn towards everything else that will make this thing finished. One thing I've already started, even though I've set aside the book, I have started messing around with the cover. Uh, I have had an idea for the cover from the word go. I have actually a doodle of it on a post-it note right here on my monitor that I've been looking at for 65 weeks or something. And I'm just, that's, and I still like that idea. And that's what I've been playing with and putting together as the cover. Um, D versus M covers. Anyone who's followed me, anyone who's read the books know there's like a, there's an aesthetic to them. There's like a design uh, parameter to them. Uh, it's always a white cover with black text with redacted elements. And the image is always a kind of a blood effect where some sort of subject is revealed by the void and the blood. That's, it's always that kind of thing. It will always be that kind of thing. Um, someday I'll talk about the, the decisions behind the covers and why they're like that. But so this is the same thing. I'm looking at it. I actually have, uh, I was previewing my work in progress 90, uh, 79 cover before we started. It's right here. I'm looking at it. <laughs> I think it's pretty close. I think I'm pretty close to finishing it. Then I'll be turning my attention to writing an introduction, which is something that every, every D versus M has a, a page of, it's not necessarily a full page of writing, but it's, there's one page that's sort of the introduction to the story. It's like the, the, the narrator, me talking about working with his source on these leaked documents that he's comicizing. Um, I think I've talked, I haven't talked about this in a long time, but I have talked about it in past videos. I write the introduction after the dust has settled and I read the comic and I try to think what will, what can I, this is the first thing the reader is going to read. What both briefs them on anything they're going to need to understand for this story and also will enhance the story like what are the what is the way to kind of it's the opening scroll in star wars it's what do i have to do to kind of get you in the right headspace for the story i've written is there anything here that i think will be enhanced if i can emphasize it in the introduction so you read this and now you're you've got this in your head and now you're going into the story and it's going to hit better because you have this prep that i've given you so that's something i still have to write i haven't even taken a stab at it I don't even, that's not going to take a long time, but I don't even, again, I need to read through this book to even send, get a sense of what would be a useful introduction. Um, I have to write, every D versus Sem ends with a Men in Black planted news article. 
which I need to write. I've pulled some newspapers from uh, the Arizona Daily Star in 1979, because this takes place in Southern Arizona. That would be the most local paper in that time. Uh, I've saved some pages. I've looked for like, where can I fit in a planted article? And, you know, so I, I, I got, but that's another thing. I haven't even written that. I, I, I have a sense of what it will be, but I, I haven't actually sat and done it and then done all the Photoshop magic to make it look like an old newspaper. Um, I need to do a thank you page. I usually do some sort of leaked classified document at the end. And I know what that's going to be, but I haven't started making it yet. So there's all these little things. Like I have to write the back cover blur. That's the other thing. Like when people pick this up at a con and read the back, what are they reading? Also on the back, I have my parental advisory warnings. This one has a new one. So I have to make, there are these little, let me see if I have it handy. I don't know if I, oh, here, just to show for the people who may not know. Okay, so D versus M 1975. Parental advisory. Graphic violence, language, partial nudity. All right. Uh, 97s had graphic violence, language, and I think tobacco use, because Jenny chain smokes the whole time. 79 will have graphic violence, language, and a new one, animal harm, which I don't have an icon for. Like, I don't have a little graphic. So I need to, I need to come up. I have an idea for it, but I haven't drawn it. This is the, all the little things that like, so this is where this is therefore the title of this video done ish. The hardest part is over. The most time consuming, the worst, the most grueling part is over drawing a page a week for 60 weeks. Like that's, that's done. Okay. There might be some edits. That's nothing though. Now it's just like this last, last stuff, the last stuff you do before people come over for Thanksgiving. But it's, you know, it's gonna be like some work. It's gonna be probably another week or two before I'm placing the print order. Um, now let me check, I thought I saw, you have anyone else proof it also? Okay, I'm just gonna catch this up before I start letting people in. Uh, as so I did, I think I mentioned this usually, usually I'll have at least one person read through it with the instruction, like, let me know anything that's a problem. Look for ty typos above all else. Typos are my most, this is also, and this is the other thing that when you ask someone to look at it, you need to kind of impress upon them. This is drawn. Like I can't, there's no story changes now <laughs> that that's past like that's not like this is the story it's it first of all typos spelling anything like that second is there anything where you're looking at the panel and you don't understand what you're looking at or or you notice again continuity issues like this character's badge switch sides or whatever you know just little things like that like look for those things um, that's what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for editorial notes because it's, it's, it's too late, man. Like, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you, you know, that, that was earlier. I pass the script around, I get feedback. I may or may not make changes based on the feedback and that's, and then I make editorial choices while I'm drawing. That's sort of my last chance to make little course corrections and like, oh, this could work a little better if I do this or that. Once it's drawn, like it's like the film is shot. Now we're just talking about like, is the sound mix right? Like we're not. So I, I probably will have somebody go through it. And Christopher, you'd be game to look over a PDF, you know. I, it's I, no pressure, but I, I, I do like to have at least one completely virgin set of eyes looking at this because i mean that's that's basically the obstacle with proofreading is 
you've seen it so many times and you know what you mean, you know what you're trying to say, you know what this drawing is supposed to be, that you're not, it's kind of like a, this is not a pipe thing. You're not seeing it anymore. You're seeing what you think it is. It's, it's a, <laughs> so that's why I like to pull in somebody who's like maybe not seen any of it yet. You know, and just like, okay, I need your, 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 uh, completely, uh, oblivious. <laughs> like I'm an alien that landed and you're showing me this thing kind of take. Okay. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> I like strong Kung Fu. Yeah, it's, it's gotta be good. It's gotta be good, especially with the D versus M. Um, <laughs> Jim is doing a, a press junket for a full fungus. Busy guy, lots of interviews. Thank you, Jim. Jim, you've also, I want to give a special shout out. There will also be a thank you page in the book, but I want to give a special uh, shout out to Jim, who we fairly regularly check in on each other on our creative projects. And it's a necessary part I think of the whole thing. I did do D versus M 1975, mostly in a cave. I mostly, I told people I was working on a comic and that was about it. Like I really, it was a very private uh, experience. And it worked, but as time has gone on, I feel like it's more and more important to have uh, creative friends and allies when you're going through this process and especially like someone to kind of touch base with periodically and just do little updates or a little frustration, like just to vent to or whatever it's, it's helpful. And Jim was that to me. So he is uh, part of how Beaver's Zem 1979 came together. Okay. What am I doing with the animals? You'll have to read and see. You'll have to read and see. Okay, all right, so we have two people in the green room. I'm gonna let them in uh, in quick succession. First we have, uh, first of all, like get both, uh, give me waves if you're ready to go. I say, I see one, I see, uh, there we go, all right. Um, we've got, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I think I see. Uh, so we've got uh, the one and only Josh Kemble, or the Kremlin. Uh, oh, hi. I, I was just working on some type uh, for uh, my comic. And, nice. uh, yeah. I'm not sure about the placement or the kerning yet. Yeah. I need to I'm not sure about that kerning either. I think that something about the, the I, the D and the I and the S. Yeah, I think you could close that up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I mean, it's more like I, D, is, agree. Yeah, uh, it's more, yeah, I, D, D. Yeah, it kind of, yeah, ID, ID is agree. Yeah, so okay. I, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, uh, oh, yeah congrats. Uh, thank you. There's a lot of stuff I, I wanted to mention from what you've said. Please, uh, okay, well, put a pin in it. I'm yeah, going yeah, yeah. we'll, we'll to and then you're going to have the floor first. Awesome. So, okay. And then Keith Foster, All right. writer All right. of Animals. Wow. Yeah, I know. And look at I'm that. A, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, what's I guess it would be like a comic like polygamist, right? Like I now write three. So uh, just, I went from it's... Yeah, man. So I mean it's it's been a fun journey to go from just writing one comic for all this time. Um, but you know, I have I have three now, and uh, the third one is Animals, which is coming out in uh in a little bit, but uh, I'll have time for that. So go ahead. I John. love the art I've seen so far that you've been sharing on Facebook. So yeah, okay, so uh thank you both. For coming, Josh, you say you sound you seem like you're champing at the bit to respond to some of my uh, my opening salvo. So go ahead. Well, okay, I'm really jealous of the Kubrick book that you showed, and yeah, it, yeah. it reminded me of another great kind of unfinished project, which is like Terry Gilliam's uh, Don Quixote, which never yes. saw the light of day. Um, of all of those like notorious ones, though, I, I have this strange confidence. Like I usually don't hypothesize and go, oh, it, it, it's a shame. 
But when it's Kubrick, right. it's like I've never seen a bad Kubrick movie. Even yes. like The Shining, where it totally destroyed the actual book. It's yeah. still like one of the best movies ever made. Um, Absolutely. Because it's Kubrick. So like you could just put it on mute and it'll be the most visually stunning thing you've ever seen. I've never. I, yeah. I would agree. Like even my least favorite Kubrick movies are kind of mesmerizing and kind of fun to watch. Like, for example, I now I haven't rewatched it. I've only seen it once. Eyes Wide Shut didn't really work for me. No. I, I felt I, you know, I, I was but I was engrossed the whole time i was yeah. never bored i was really just like grit like i was like i this is just kind of a beautiful thing that's unfolding but i i have the sense it's one i remember i still have the same feeling i came out of thinking like either i'm not smart enough to get this movie or it's a lot of bullshit like you know and like i i so i bet but in any case it's beautiful and entertaining yeah you if know, it's I bullshit like it's, it's beautiful bullshit <laughs> yeah it's beautifully done yeah. bullshit but like and and that you know execution is king like that counts for something you yeah. know but i i yeah, that's an example where yeah probably no matter what it would be very interesting yeah and very watchable yeah. yeah um so there was that there was uh you were questioning how to pronounce somebody's name and yes. i believe it was croissant i think that was the <laughs> was it was it yeah, croissant? yeah croissant. it was croissant i, yeah. I believe um <laughs> Yeah. And and that was it. Other than uh, also, I don't know if you guys caught this, but Gary was giving you the hint to search his previous books for typos because he said there were none. So English grammar nerds. I know. Start it made me through. scared. Just saying it out loud, I was like, oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm like, is, he gave you permission, so find this. This is a challenge. No, actually, I. you know what? I would welcome it because that is a, something I... Uh, we, I've talked about this with uh, Keith and, and Scott Lost a little bit, like when, how, and where is it appropriate to go back and screw yeah. with your old work? Typos are always allowed. Yeah. I don't care. Like I will live with a bad drawing. Like I will say like, look, that was me at the time. That was my level at the time. That was the amount of time I allowed myself. That was good enough for me when I sent it off to the printer. Do I love it now? No, but I'm going to just respect like, that's the past. I'm moving forward. But typos, absolutely not. No, yeah. that would be new edition. Current versions are shredded. Like, no, uh, yeah. Uh. No, I, I, yeah, so I, think I don't know, man. If you dropped a couple grand on a print run, you might, uh, you might change your mind. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think I honestly, that's how strongly I feel. The job I had before the county was basically an L, like, a proofreader and then i was leading a team of proofreaders that when i was at the stationery company you know i was i was a graphic designer but i was also a big part of it was just spot checking text on cards and things so it was like no i no i have like a professional reputation here yeah <laughs> like yeah. i can't that's reasonable the one place that that may not be wanted feedback at least publicly would be in the case where somebody has a publisher who's already invested in like a first edition print run yes. like it might be better to just reach out to the writer so that if there's ever a second edition they can fix it but like yes. posting yeah. about it at that point there's really not much you can do no, um, yeah. yeah so yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, it sounds like Josh is done with his thoughts. So he. I, yeah, I'm yes. sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Okay. Now, now it's my turn. Um. So Go for yeah, it. the the first the first thing is that so number one I have three number one about typos. Um. Yes. I can proofread something eighty five times and be like it's fine. The second yeah. you get the printed book back, like I don't oh, know, maybe this is like my superpower, but it's like I can turn to the exact page and yes. there's a guy. You see it immediately. Yeah. We used to oh, joke when I was writing for Village Voice Media, we just all would kind of with a sad chuckle talk to each other. Like me and Chris Ward and our our even our editors was like the best way to spot a typo is to send it to print. Like that <laughs> or or to like publish it. Go ahead and hit publish on the website. So you're going to the website and reading it. And then immediately you see it. You proofread yeah. that thing 12 times. Yep. It doesn't matter. Yeah, totally. Totally. I'm um, okay. So and the that'll other stand thing, out. Uh, sorry. That'll stand out kind of like a glaring headlight that's just going to bug you for like, oh. the, like it's, it's this giant billboard that will bother yeah. you more than like drawing somebody with a left thumb on a right hand. Like it's, it's so yeah. bad, but yeah. it, it, notoriously will never never fail to happen which is why it's so good to have people proof your stuff that aren't you 
yes um, for work anyhow sorry go ahead oh, well and that's and there yeah. but what is intriguing to me is and i've never heard it explained i'm sure someone someone knows why this is what changes once it's out in your brain where yeah. now you can see it like why couldn't you see it before why do you see it now is it like it, and is it a tr is it just a trick of perception like if i sat and perforated this and imagined like this was out and everybody was reading it would that help me find the like what is like wh what's what changed in my brain where now i see it but mm. i don't know yeah, I've I've heard the I've heard the adage of reading backwards. That helps. Although backwards, hey, I'm in a mirror. I've heard like if you yeah, pull you know, it up, well, you know what also helps. Just I mean, this is this is like lazy and it, and it requires money. But you could also just pay for Grammarly. But then again, yeah. Grammarly doesn't do comics, right? Like that's the problem. No. Although it might, yeah. for all I you know. But anyway, well, and I do a lot of, and you would probably do. I think as a novelist, you would have this issue too. Well, and Josh, the comics, oh, you why do Grammarly? If you do a lot of natural language, Grammarly will start throwing flags on the play all yeah. left and right. Totally. You know, they're like, well, that's not right. And it's like, yeah, I know. Vernacular. Yeah. <laughs> I totally. know I dropped the G from running. You yeah. know, yeah. like, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the yeah, worst absolutely. is when you're working in all caps because it's comics and yeah. um and like it it gives you like capitalization errors all the time and you're like, look, I don't need caps. Like yeah. the only time I need to worry about caps is if I'm saying I as in me <laughs> and not I at the beginning of a sentence, you know. Right. Yeah. 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 My my first novel actually uh has German entry, uh German entries, journal, not German, journal. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like German. Um, wow. You're like my yeah, first journal, novel journal, comp. <laughs> Yeah. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, journal entries from the 1600s. So Grammarly oh. loses its mind on that. Yeah, you know, it oh, doesn't know. I mean, you're, it's it's tricky, right? Like I'm not going to write in the actual old language of the time because it's unreadable. But yes. but so what you end up doing is you end up writing in something that is intended to evoke the old language without yeah. actually being the the nightmare that writing in that language would be from hundreds of years ago. You know? Yeah, yeah. It uh, is so, fascinating. Okay. Even if you read English from 300 years ago, how difficult, how really difficult it is to even, yeah. you know, like track what, what the hell is being said. And I remember uh, one of my favorite movies, uh, David Eggers' The Witch. Um, I adore it, I adore it, I adore it. But I've seen it with a few people who have said, and I don't blame them, like, I wish it had subtitles. Because even though they're speaking English the entire time, he made a point of trying to write it in um, sort of, I think, 17th century, 18th century, uh, New World mm -hmm. language. And it's tough. It's, yeah. it's often very, very tough. Yeah, totally. 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 All right, so my, my second thing. Oh, God, let me yes. see if I... Oh. Well, so this actually um, summarizes a lot of my view on what Scott and I talk about on the Making Comics podcast, and I think he he agrees on this one. It's the it's the Paul Valeri or Valerie um, line: a, a, a work is never finished; it's abandoned. Yeah, so at, at there's yeah. look, you 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 file it. In fact, it's something that I'm struggling with with a couple of short stories I've written because I feel like they're not done. Um, and in fact, I had just gone through this big elaborate thing of like, what if I did this? You know, yeah. what if I did this? I, I was actually fixated with passing time in, in, in a short story where someone is there for a whole evening. And I was like, am I passing time well enough? You know, because what I have right now is, you know, the next hour went fine. He did this. He did that. You know, I'm, I'm just presenting it in summary. And then I was thinking, what if I changed it all to like timestamp journal entries? Like that would make be easier for me to do it. And I went through this whole big arc all the way around. And then I'm like, you know what? It doesn't add anything. It just makes it different, you know? And, and that's yeah. the adage that my novel instructor gave me. It was that, you know, you're done when changes only make it different and they don't make it any better right. anymore. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily so, better. And that's yeah. a good observation because yeah. it also acknowledges the... the near infinite potential, like, I, you know, there are many ways to skin a cat. Like you have a story to tell, you have, the, and there's probably lots of ways to do it. And if you get lost in like, boy, I didn't even occur to me I could do it this way. It's like, I'm sure there's eight other ways you yeah. can do it that you haven't thought of, you know, it's mm -hmm. just at one, and when it comes to work not being finished, only abandoned, which I 100% agree with, 
I think it's almost like probably like, when are you willing to send your kids out of the house? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. like you, you know, like it's never going to be, uh, they're perfectly prepared for the world and no one's ever going to hurt them and they're never going to hurt anybody and everything's going to be fine. Like at some point it's like, uh, like, I guess you're going to have to fly man and you boot them out of the nest. So, and that's a little bit, I think with work where it's like, I think this is, it's, it's going to have to just now, stand up on its own and i'm gonna have to wash my hands of it yeah and i'm conf i feel comfortable with decisions i made creatively it's the story i want to tell it's close enough to the vision that was in my head which is never going to match a hundred percent yeah um it, and now it's time to move on you know it, you know it kind of reminds me of like um the difference between a critic and a writer or a critic and a leader um weirdly enough it's like there's there's kind of this um like uh I, I guess the way i'd say it is it's like a it's a telltale sign of a new person in art or in writing where they'll be publicly critical of everything and yet they won't have produced work um and and this is a natural thing for like most artists because like you do have taste and stuff like that, that you're developing before you've developed the skills um, yeah. and it's very similar with like people who've never been in leadership roles um, are usually the most critical of leaders because sure. they, because yeah. they don't understand like compromises and stuff like that, that you have to do to lead people. Uh, it's very similar with art where it's like there's compromises you have to do to actually just get things done. And yeah. um, and so it's like it's very easy to be like a sideline kind of commentator who's watching a wrestling match and being like, well, I would have done it this way or watching a boxer and being like, right. well, I wouldn't have taken that right hit right. in the ring. Right. Why isn't he working the jab? Yeah, they're not in the ring, like getting exhausted, like right. having their heart rate like get screwed up, and like and and not being able to think consciously straight, you know? Right. Um. Right. And so it's it, it to me, I I don't know, like a telltale sign of like a, a really good leader is somebody who's going to be able to actually get things accomplished or done. Um, right. And it's the same with a good writer, where it's like if you, if you're a good writer, you're going to have like some some writing under your belt. Um, and if you have writing under the, your belt, at some point you abandon it and there will be errors or there will be things that aren't perfect. Or it won't be um, exactly what you intended or, never, you know, yeah, never. it's, yeah, it's no, I, I think there's a lot of truth in that. And, yeah. it's, and I think also, it's funny, I didn't intend uh, the Napoleon book to be such a, a thing I would keep coming back to, but I think it also when I look at what I would describe as an amateur critic, versus someone who's maybe a, like an actual, like a legitimate critic, yeah. like someone who is, you know, or an actual creator. I think sometimes it's the difference. Like, I, I think amateur critics tend to be comparing what they're seeing against an imagined ideal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As opposed to what this thing was trying to be or what's actually, what is the creator actually capable of? Or what were the what you're talking about? What are the different challenges they were facing and having to make choices about? You know, like yeah, they like the go through the process and yeah. had to execute something. Yeah, I forget what it is. The amateur, the, the armchair guy. Sorry, What's that? Go, it was a goth, the guy, the critic who kind of um, I, I can't I can never pronounce his name right, but it's G O T H E. The yeah, I, mean, I never know how to pronounce. He's one of the Godfathers of criticism, like one right. of his core points was like the idea of like ascribing intention to like your review because like it, it's purposeless to tell an artist you failed here if the artist's intention is different from yours like right if right their intention like, is yeah like, like, sad, and, and like a, and you're a like very this, yeah easy lame example would be like you go and see a jackie chan movie and you're like there was like no story. Yeah, you're like, oh, <laughs> you know, it's like the action. Like, what's like, going yeah, on? Yeah, like that's <laughs> yeah, like it, you're you're totally misunderstanding what you're supposed to be. Like, what this thing is supposed to be. Yeah, what it's yeah. trying to be. Right. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. So that's, but it also it 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 inoculates you against useless feedback when you once you're aware of that. Once mm -hmm. you realize, like, this person doesn't even. Like they're participating in criticism as a hobby, you know, where it's just like, let me find things wrong with this yeah. thing. You mm -hmm. know, like, let me find things that I can imagine something that I would like better. You know, like this is all like you, it's very easy to dismiss that. And we, I know Josh, you've talked about this before. What's the, the toughest 
pills to swallow are when someone points something out and you're like, yeah, 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 <laughs> you're right. You're right. That, that's you're when right. you're, you're in, when you're in the ring and a boxer is looking at it and being like, oh, you should have like done yeah. this particular move that I've done in the past. And you're like, right. oh, crap, like they're right. Like that's the right. kind of analysis that hits home. Yeah. And I think actually helps us improve as artists, too. Yeah. Um, Though I would say I will say, like. I could end up being proven wrong, but at least in my experience so far. And I, I think this has taken work. It takes time. I have gotten to a point where legitimate critique or, when, you know, something where I think it's like a fair you know, fair piece of feedback that's not gushing. Mm -hmm. I'm actually pretty grateful for because it does help me make it better. And yeah. it helps me think about like, even if I, if it's too late to fix, it's like, well, I'll, I'll think about that going forward. I think the, the feedback that aggravates me is I think more of like the bad faith kind of like, yeah. you don't even know what the F you're talking about kind of feedback where it's like, Ugh. Ugh. you know that will agitate me because it's like just because i get frustrated with people I, I i'm very intellectually vain i get frustrated with people i think are dumb so like when they, i'm getting feedback where it's like oh you're a moron like then yeah. uh, that will aggravate me but i like there was a thing i remember for uh d versus m 97 i uh someone bought it and read it and i was talking to them and they were saying very very nice things and i was like oh that's great thank you very much thank you very much and, was, and they said like there was one thing though and i was like oh and there was i don't know if people remember i don't have it handy there's a scene where jenny it's early on she's sitting on the edge of a canyon and it's all kind of spread out in front of her and she's taking pictures and because it's black and white and because i wasn't really working with gray tones and like they were like, I couldn't really tell like how close or far this was. I couldn't tell how flat this was. I couldn't tell what I was like. They had no sense of depth with this. You know, it just, it just, it didn't work. And I still think about that because it was, but not in a, like a, Ooh, yeah. Ooh, like not like that. Sort of like, mm, I see, I see what they're talking about. Yeah. Like I went back and looked at it and I was like, Oh yeah, I see, you know, like, yeah. And, but I'm, I, while I say like, I still think about it and it's been years, like it's not in a, like, I still think about that time. Like that girl broke my heart. Like, yeah. it's not like that. It's like, it's like, oh no, that was a good, I got to yeah, watch that for that point forward. Yeah. I don't want to do that again, you know? And like that I'm fine with. Uh, um, Keith actually gave me, uh, I had him read the script for 79. Mm -hmm. And he uh, he had I, I can't spoil it, but Keith, I don't know if you'll even remember. Uh, we'll, we're about to find out. Yeah, <laughs> we, we'll see. You had some feedback about a particular sequence of events where something was a little confusing to you, and the way you were presenting it to me, it's like I was confused by da 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 da. It was I could tell by the way you explained it that you had interpreted it, that scene all wrong. Mm -hmm. And I, I was like, well, and I, I never thought like, oh, he didn't read it. I thought like, oh, I made it very unclear. Yeah. You know, that was my react. Like that was that it was kind of, you gave me really good feedback sort of accidentally where you were like, oh, the, you know, the part where this happens. I was like, that, that's not what happened. Like, right, I was like, right. clearly I didn't make that very clear, you know? So mm -hmm. that made me go back and kind of rewrite some things to make it more explicit what was happening. Yeah. So like that's also feedback. I think about that all the time. I think about that like, oh yeah, like they totally missed what I was trying to do there. So now I gotta, you know, I, I gotta make sure like, is this clear? Is this like, yeah. you, am I being I, I think that's, covered by half? Like what's happening? Yeah. I think that's a good thing about, you know, something that like, you know, it's, it's accidental, but it's sort of like, it's purposely accidental, if you know what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because, because part of the part of the thing that we do so often when we feedback for each other, not only you know us, because um, you know you've you've read some advances of my stuff as well, um, but I do this all the time in my workshop too. Is that the best thing you can do when you're giving feedback is to simply talk about its effect on you, yes. right? Yes. And because a lot of people, and I mean a lot of people, prescribe the fix, and it's like don't don't you know like sure yeah. like if. if 
you get to the end of your criticism or your feedback and then you want to prescribe a fix like I was thinking it might work like this. Like I have, you know, I, one out of 10 of those things I take, but the one out of 10 is pretty good. Um, and so I'm like, yeah, I actually kind of like that. I think that's a clever way to go about this. But yes. what you can do so often is just, this is, this is what I thought. This is the thing on the page. So, I mean, again, it was kind of an accident, but the fact that yeah. I was verbose about it and its effect on me made yeah. it work anyway. Right. Yeah. yeah. And no, and I, and I 100% agree. I've always preferred, and it's the kind of feedback I give, like Keith, you've probably, you've, I know you've experienced it, Josh, if I was ever in a position to like, you know, proofread anything of yours, you'll see that I never prescribe. I never mm -hmm. say this would be even better if you blow a block. I actually, that is a pet peeve of mine where it's like, I, you're the storyteller, not me. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you how to tell your story. Like, I don't know. I'm just going to tell you, this is, this is was how I took it. This is how I mm -hmm. felt about it. This part, at most, I'll say like, this part didn't work for me. I didn't quite get like where, yeah. like how that went to this, or you know, whatever. Like, or uh, I feel like yeah. this is maybe this could be tightened up, or maybe this could be elaborated. I like, but I, I won't say like this is how this is what I would do. You know, like yeah. I, I feel like that's, and no offense to anyone. I, if there's probably someone watching who has proofread my script and they've said like this is what I would do, and it's like that's. I, it's I'm not no, he's offended. calling you out. You know I, I'm calling you out. Never do that. No, 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 no. This is my personal taste. I I actually weigh on the spectrum of how I evaluate other people's work. I think I'm way on the side of what were you trying to do? Like I I really really try hard not to bring my own. Like I I want to know like. The best editors I ever had, like when I was at Village Voice, their their goal was to figure out what are you trying to say with this, and let's see if we can sharpen that. Let's see if we can make that more clear, more effective, more punchy, more crisp. You know, it wasn't like if I was writing a review of whatever Halo or something, it wasn't like, well, I really liked Halo. You know, like, and like, and like, maybe you should put something in about, no, no, no. It's like, this is your position on Halo. Yeah. I get what you're saying. I think it would be clearer if you, you know, that's the kind of editing I want. Yeah. Where it's like, you're seeing what I'm trying to do and you're helping me get there. I don't yeah. need yeah. how you would get there. Mm -hmm. I, like, I'm canoeing to the island. I don't yeah. need to hear like, well, what about water wings? What like, if you throw in this new thing. character that I invented? Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Right. You know, That's I, I, I think the the thing that I'm seeing as a commonality with like constructive feedback, I think this works for visuals too. Um like quite often like the struggle with graphic design, illustration, cartooning, whatever it is, is like we're visually communicating. And when there's a failure to communicate that's where we need to kind of revise and improve, right? Like, yeah. so if I'm trying to like make a, a visual idea conveyed really clearly and I show it to somebody and they aren't getting that message. It's misunderstood. That's, yeah. That's yeah. where I need to do the work as the visual communicator. It's the same with like, as a storyteller, it's like, I have this idea in my head, I'm trying to communicate. Yeah. What constructive feedback is really helpful for is like, they can tell you like Keith did, where it's where that where that intention and the actual communication are breaking down so that right. you can fix it because it's communication and, and, it, and it, it off it puts it puts the burden where it rightly belongs which is yeah. back on the creator yeah it's like look this is how i took it or didn't get it or whatever and really the question then you need to ask yourself is like Am I okay with that? So for yeah. example, and I go to this one because it's an easy example I give all the time with D versus M. Once in a while, I'll get the feedback like, it'd be really cool in color. Okay, well, I'm not doing it in color. So like mm -hmm. that's, but that's an example of like, that's what they want. Black and white looks unfinished to them. Black and white, they're not a huge fan of. They're giving me that feedback. It's legitimate feedback. But now I have the decision like, do I want to do anything with that? And in that case, no. <laughs> I don't like I'm I know what I'm doing on the other hand like for example the Keith script feedback I was like oh no that's that's no good that's mm -hmm. like I can't have that like I am yeah remind me back. remind me to tell you um Scott and I I'm not gonna say it here because 
there's an outside chance the person's listening and I don't want to make them feel bad. Oh, right call now. them out. Call them out. This I is actually, a hot gloss I wonder, for Gary. I wonder, Stream. Gary, if it was the year you were at Fan Fusion, but there was a uh, there was a very famous suggestion I got one time around one of my comics. <laughs> and uh, we'll we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it all. Oh time. gosh, I don't remember. Yeah, no, I'm dying to I'm dying to hear it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I want to hear it too. And I want to hear it live so it's hot gossip for Gary yeah, Hodges. No way. <laughs> Burn him to the ground right here. Gary oh, Hodges no exclusive. Doc, so yeah. do it. No, I'm just kidding. That's right. Um, I uh, hey I, I did want to I don't I don't know if you want to like veer off topic topic a little bit. No go ahead. But it's it's sort of on topic it's sort of not. I'm and I'm kind of I'm kind of teasing an episode of making comics that we're going to record because it's something that I've been thinking about a lot. So you guys, you're film guys, right? You watch Kubrick and you're talking about Kubrick and you have a specific thing, Definitely Gary. Films, not movies, films. So, <laughs> yes. Sorry, I just wanted to sound films. pretentious. Yeah, I, don't, I don't watch movies. Um, so yeah, and I'm not, I'm not much, I'm, I'm neither a film nor movie guy. Really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, I have stuff I watch for well, sure. Listen, I, I feel like you have a very impressive I know you. I know for a fact you at least have a very impressive knowledge of of like Shaw Brothers kung fu movies. Yeah, yeah I mean, Which, thank I think... you. It's it's one of those things of like uh, a buddy of mine told me this, and I found it very flattering. It's like the things I love, I go all in on, right? Yes. So, yeah, yeah. Godzilla films, kung fu films, but but I don't I don't just go we're, to the movies. You know, we're all well. That's I forgot Godzilla films as well. Uh, I wonder if that. So we all have that in common, I think. Yes. When I we think find something love we love, food. there's no like little half measure with it. Like mm-hmm. we really yeah, exactly. go all in. And is it a coincidence that we're all also creatives? Or do you think that is like a, a maybe even integral part of being a creative is this willingness to like just dive in hard on something. I don't, you were going somewhere, you were taking us off rails and I took us no, off I'm rails not, from your off rails. I'm this, sorry. this is actually not, this is actually not that off rails. Um, okay. So I'll continue the thought and then we can talk about okay. it a little bit maybe okay. because this, we might find the answer inside. Um, so for me, I've had two musical obsessions since the calendar hmm. year took. Um, the first, it, it's also worth noting, I, I am a musician. I've been making music for years. Um, yes. My first obsession was roughly January 10th through about February 15th, maybe even a little bit later. And it was electric era Miles Davis. Okay. Um, so basically anything from Bitches Brew on. Which is, by the way, the next Bitches Brew, th- easily best Miles Davis album. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. It's, it's super good, right? So, so Miles goes Bitches Brew, and then he goes on the corner. And then what happens is the next three records that came out, if I remember right, maybe one is original stuff, but the other three are actually nothing more than outtakes from Bitches Brew and On the Corner. Um, mm-hmm. So he, you know, like he he was there. And then obviously there was demand for it because Bitches Brew just turned the jazz world on its head. And um, but the crazy thing about a lot of Bitches Brew and well, let me let me continue. So then that went into my current obsession, which I've texted a buddy of mine who's a fan of this person as well. And that is MF Doom. So yes. I am on a huge, I mean huge, MF I, Doom. I gathered that from the last Making Comics, you were talking about MF Doom. I was like, he's yeah. really in a love affair with MF Doom right now. And, and, yeah. and again, this, this conversation in a, in a different context is going to get repeated a little bit. So I'm not going to say some of my, my, my uh, most detailed stuff on it. But the, the thing is, if you wrote down some of MF Doom's lyrics, right? He's known for his intricate wordplay, but if you mm. write them down, they're kind of nonsense. You know what I mean? Like I, I just happen to be, yeah, I mean, and, and I'm driving up here, right? And, and I love hip hop of, of many eras. You Me know, too. As long as it involves like rhyming, rhyming, right? Like not, mm-hmm. not auto tune and very slow beats, the current kind of hip hop thing. We're talking, you know, old sounding hip hop, 80s and 90s. But like, I love wordplay and MF Doom is known for this amazing wordplay, but like, Mm -hmm. it's not clean, you know, like his sentences don't, his, his rhymes don't really link together. He doesn't really tell stories, you know, it's just pure goddamn rhyming. Yeah. You know, and, and the thing is, it's very wrong, you know, like if you wrote it down, you'd be like, what the fuck is this? You know? And, and I think. I, and and I think Miles Davis, you know, when we get to electric era Miles Davis, we get to stuff that that at once, you know, you I think this is your line about Kubrick, Gary. It's like, I don't think I get this. And mm-hmm. I think 
I think maybe if maybe a future more intelligent version of me is going to get it, and maybe yeah. it, it's not because there's there's plenty of times where I'll listen to this and and you like it would be very normal for someone else to walk in the room and go like this sucks, yep. <laughs> you know, right. like like it's it it sounds like noodling. It sounds yeah. you know amazing how you kind of start this one place and then you make this journey and then you end at complete mastery of craft. And some of the shit sounds just like an eight year old tuning their instrument, you know? Right. And it's like, and so I think with, with MF doom, it's like that too, you know, like I get the feeling that some people could sit down and, you know, 80% emulate MF doom and it's not going to work because this yeah, is right. a dude who, you know, again, when, when, when uh, Daniel Dumoulay ended up, becoming mf doom that was at the end of a first rap career anyway yeah. And, yeah and like you can tell late in his in his career he's just he's just messing around you know to, it, it's like it's like keanu reeves at the at the end of the first matrix like you're sitting there bored blopping blocking all the fists <laughs> yeah. you know, like, right. you know yeah. but but I, and and hendrix was like that too and and like you can I make the like, argument well that what i'm saying yeah 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 oh go, go ahead Gary. like they all did like, those two you know, all of them, they're just complete masters. And anyway, so I think this lends to like mastery and, and how we perceive it and how maybe we crave it. Yeah. Well, it makes me think of, uh, as more of a movie guy, it makes me think of David Lynch, mm -hmm. where I feel like, like, I think I am just entering the past few years, entering an era of really understanding how to appreciate David Lynch. Yeah. Where I think for a long time, like I love, I love the Elephant Man, but that's a very traditional. That's probably the most traditional Lynch thing, like he's mm -hmm. ever done. You know, it's not. It's very accessible. Like it's not. You know, but there was a lot of his stuff, like Lost Highway, and and, and even some of the Twin Peaks stuff, like where I was just like, this is just a bunch of bullshit. Mm -hmm. Like this is nonsense. I don't understand what it means. And I think I'm just getting to the point. Maybe like people who are really into Lynch will quibble with this but my attitude now is like i don't think there's anything to get it's an experience yeah. like he's mm -hmm. he is expressing himself he's just trusting the thoughts that bubble up in his brain not questioning them just deciding they have value he's not trying to muscle them into any kind of form or function he's just telling his story and you're supposed to kind of just sit there and have this dream with him i yeah. think that's what how you approach lynch Eyes Wide Shut might be a similar thing. Like yeah. where it's like yeah. me, like my initial frustration with it was like, I don't even see what this is doing. Like, yeah, like I don't what's the through line here? Yeah. Of this yeah. was. And maybe there is no, maybe it's just a kind of amusing, you know? Yeah. It's like, I don't have a point when I go on these live streams. I start just talking, you know, maybe yeah. it's sort of the same thing. It's just an artistic version of that is what they're doing. I, so, I don't yeah. know. So yeah. there's two, th two right. things, Keith, that, uh, that brings up first off, like I'm, I'm a huge uh, nerd about hip hop too, and very much like into the old school of hip hop. And I think for like modern hip hop, I think the most compelling, interesting person to me that I've deep dived into is Kendrick Lamar, who I think mm. is just an utter genius, mm. but also he doesn't make easy albums. Like, um, and one of, one of my favorite things like is getting somebody to unlock Kendrick Lamar by starting with like good kid, mad city and um or good kid bad city and mm -hmm. like dissecting that album because it's like it sounds like a very stupid like the the singles from it come across like a very stupid kind of like album uh and but but when you listen to each uh character that he's playing within this like longer narrative it becomes this like brilliant skillful like um control over the entire medium of, of hip hop mm. and like every album he releases, like damn, like the latest one, uh, um, uh, the, the big steppers, like mm -hmm. these are albums are like albums, like full albums that you have to kind of do beginning to end. They're an experience like a Chris Ware book or something where you have to oh, set yeah. aside like a month to digest it. <laughs> um, but I love the fact that like he'll do things in hip hop, like just repeating top of the morning. This became a meme online. 20 times um because he can because he's kendrick mm -hmm. like and i love that um it also so the second thing is it, how it relates to comics i think a younger cartoonist looks at more simplified cartooning um one of my favorite cartoonists is graham annabelle who i think is easily one of the best artists alive 
Like he does a lot of stuff like box trolls and stuff like that, but he also does Grickle, which I think is an underrated, um, brilliant comic book. But it looks like a stick figure. And yeah. and most people would look at that and be like, I have no idea why this guy's the head story artist on right. all of these amazing animated movies. Like, come on, it's a stick figure. But right. any artist who's seasoned is going to look at that and be like, I can't do that. Like, I am not that good of an artist to right. boil it down to its simplicity, kind of like Miles Davis or or like right. or like MF Doom, where it's like MF Doom will do stuff that sounds kind of idiotic but then like if mm. you were in the industry you'd be like i, I couldn't do that I, I couldn't get away mm. with it i'm not right. skillful enough to deliver that um, right that's yeah. those are the two things that makes me think of is like again like when people get such a mastery of their craft that they can do things like one of the things i love about chris ware too it's like you can look at a chris ware cover uh that takes you know an hour to read because you're turning it upside down and like following this, at all this sequential yeah. narrative and it's like people who aren't cartoonists might look at that and be like oh this is nonsense this is insane but cartoonists look at that and it's like mind-blowing because how do you do that like there's there's right. one guy who can do that um i i love that kind of stuff which also i think that to me that goes back to evaluating the feedback you're getting because you it's very easy for me to picture chris ware showing any of his work to some but the wrong person yeah and then saying like this is like i don't get it i don't like it yeah. it's weird what's the point of this i don't want to sit and do this and well, you know like yeah like that kind of reaction and if chris ware doesn't have a very clear vision of what he's trying to do and at least some sense of who his audience actually is, he could get really screwed up yeah. by good faith feedback, you know? And I think that it kind of goes back to like, now the burden is on, like, get your feedback, but know how to evaluate it. Like you really need to have, and it, I think it helps you sharpen your own argument for your work. Like, what am I trying to do? What is the audience I want? How comfortable am I with confusing people? How comfortable mm -hmm. am I with, you know, frustrating people or not doing the thing they wanted yeah. or whatever? You know, I I love to bring up The Last Jedi every chance I get. But I I I I think Rian Johnson at I'm least one of the few that smoke. backs you on that, Gary, by the way. I, I back you one hundred percent on that. I love Last Jedi. It's it's I, we're all Last Jedi yeah, fans. Here. Based exactly. on his we'll shout anybody down right now. Yeah. That's right. Based on Rian Johnson's public statements, at least, which I have no reason to doubt are, you know, his actual feelings. He's 100% comfortable with what he did with that movie. Like, he's not, you don't get any sense now. He's like, yeah, I don't think yeah. it played right. No, I don't know. I had a vision. It didn't quite land. Like, he, no, he's like, I'm very, I'm delighted I got to make it and I'm happy with what we did. And, you know, and I, my, this is my own editorial. I think history will see him as, uh, uh, actually the last great Star Wars director, maybe. <laughs> but I think that's a that's an that's evidence of someone who knew what he was trying to do and did yeah. what he was trying to do and is fine with people not liking it. You yeah. know, because yeah. they're not they're not not liking it because mm, D versus M better if it was in color. Like it's not like they're not liking it because they would have done a different movie. Yes. Which is right. not legitimate. Like that doesn't Okay, you know, like anybody would have done a different movie. This was my movie. I was the director, guys. Like I yeah, was the exactly. one who got to decide. I was the this writer. Is canon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, mine, yeah, mine was like, the I, canon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and probably. and I think I think people make a mistake when they're checking out art sometimes that this whole art experience is supposed to be comfortable. And that's where like Miles yeah. Davis really freaks people out who are normies. Like it's mm -hmm. like Miles Davis uh, bitches brew deviated a lot because it went to these really uncomfortable areas where it's like, I'm going to hit an off note and then I'm going to sequence it, repeat it and it's going to work, but it's going to okay. piss you off. Like, yeah. it, and mm -hmm. it's, it, it's, it's kind of like the equivalent of like the velvet undergrounds, like heroin, where it's like, I'm going to play one chord and it's going to be discordant and, and hurt. And, and right. that's the point. Like, and right. Uh, it, it's things like that that um, that I, I really uh, 
um, I think are great. I, I think, uh, Gary, like having seen your script too, it's like if somebody reads the next D versus M expecting that they're going to have a joyful time and feel really happy at the end, um, <laughs> They might be they might be sorely disappointed, right? They probably have not um, read other D versus M's, but yeah, yeah they, right. But they, right. but there's points in there where you're intentionally building tension. You're trying to create discomfort, and it's like that. That is a writer subverting tool. expectations, and yeah. And I'm and that's also that's like you don't get by committee. You don't get a committee. No, you, you don't, don't get by produce committee. something and like you that. Also, I would say, and this is something I will be talking a lot more about the main character of D versus M in 1979 in the weeks and months to come, but. I, if you've read my previous works, you know that I, my favorite kind of character is someone who's a little complicated. That's not like a very easy, like, oh, I love this person or, oh, that person's a son of a bitch. Like it's, it's always kind of a complicated, like I'm usually aiming for, I understand this person. Like they seem like a real person. I'm not trying to like get you to feel a certain way about them. I'm trying to present a character that you can have a relationship with, you know, and you can decide, but not simplified. Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to give you a, a, a layered person as we all are. Um, I think that's another thing. Yeah. I, I can imagine, you can imagine the pinheaded notes that one could get of like, I wish Dr. Wagner was more likable, you know, mm -hmm. Go fuck yourself. Like, you know, like that's an example of like, you don't understand, like that to me is amateur criticism, you know? And that's a straw man thing. Nobody has said that to me, but no, it would be an example of like, you, you're, what you're suggesting to me is the kind of thing you imagine you would like to read. And while Steve Jobs is probably burning in hell because he was a terrible person, he was right about one thing. Which is like, sometimes you need to tell the public, you, you don't listen to the public when they're telling you what they w think they want. Sometimes you have to show them something, you know, like, and that's, I, I feel like he was dead on with that. So. Mm -hmm. I, I did want to bring back, yeah, yeah, I, I think um, as I'm, as I'm listening to us talk and, and thinking about your initial question, Gary, of like, does this, is this something inherent in creators? I think I think it's something more inherent in the creative journey, right? Like yeah. I think, you know, I, I, I'm I'm going to quote a a friend of mine who is um, he probably still DJs. I haven't talked to him in a while, you know, but I'm sure if I if I said hello, he wouldn't ignore my my text or call. Um, it's this uh, collector who goes by the name of Marcellus Wallace. Actually, he is a a, a very deep collector in the in the funk realm and he he actually did an interview with me um on a podcast my last podcast it was called the vinyl exam it ran oh, nice. about 100, 175 episodes it was all about aspects of records and record collecting the music we love and stuff like that but yeah man if you have time to burn go hunt down the marcellus wallace part one and two um because i think in there i can't remember if he said this like on air or off air but the interview is arguably my favorite of all the episodes he was talking, so he, um, he works in the, uh, he used to anyway, have a day job in the alcohol industry. And, you know, you, you obviously develop a little bit of an appreciation for, for everything that way. And he talked about how I didn't, you know, you don't just wake up wanting a PD scotch, you mm -hmm. know, you, you have to arrive at wanting PD scotches. And he was comparing it to his music yeah. taste. When he first got yeah. into music, he liked the California raisins. Now he likes obscure Italian library, you know, like mm -hmm. those don't seem to connect, but they do right. because you have to walk a path to go that way. You know? Yep. And I think PD, you know, PD scotch, Miles Davis, MF doom, Frenette yeah. Bronca. <laughs> Sorry. I'm yeah. throwing out like deep cut bartender stuff, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's like, you know, but that's those, an acquired those thing. Yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 and the funny thing is like, I don't know what the hell that is, but I bet people oh. who are like deep into like, oh, I it's like a black licorice aperitif or like an after dinner thing. It's, it's, yeah, I so think it's fairly really terrible, but, but it is a very fall. narrow. Yeah. yeah. But people deep yeah. in it appreciate Paris it. And, and you know what? Maybe maybe I'll maybe I'll turn off Miles Davis Road, mm -hmm. and five years from now I'll be on to something else because that's also part of the creative journey. You yes, know, you yes. you make a stop in Miles Davis Town, 
And then you, you move on to the next part of your journey. And then you think back and you're like, oh, I remember when I stayed in Miles Davis town for a while. And here are my favorite things about my stay in Miles Davis town. Mm -hmm. And then you move on. And cause that's part of the creative journey too. I yeah. think what's interesting about that is I think with time and experience and, and, and some of it's maturity and some of it is just exposure. It, it goes in both directions. It allows you to appreciate, uh, you know, certain kinds of liqueur or certain kinds of whatever, you know, like weird, obscure music, a strange movie that there's no way when you were 15, you would have even been able to suffer through, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. On the other end of the spectrum, I remember, I, I gosh, I can't remember the writer's name right now, but he was talking about like it, it maturity teaches you to appreciate something like a really good piece of bread. Yeah. You know, where like that, you know, as a kid, it meant like, can I get some jelly on it? Can you toast it? Can you put some nice, like, what about some butter? What about some peanut butter? What about, you know, where like, but with time, it's like, no, 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 I can just have it. Oh, natural. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like, and real, like, this is extraordinarily good sourdough. Yeah. You know, and like, and you get it. Like, I think it allows you to explore. I don't know how you put those in the same set, you know, like where it's like the, the weird way out there complexity of things, but also the simplicity and the purity of something I think. And that kind of True. goes back to Chris Ware, where like, I can imagine if someone's going to be like Chris Ware, whatever, you know, it's probably someone who, is not as far down the path of seeing, you know, a diversity of books and doesn't really like, then even if they don't finally come around to loving him, they would at least appreciate like, Oh, yeah. I, I, get, I get what he's trying to do here. And it's pretty cool. And, it, and well, at I the mean, same it, time, sorry, go, oh, go, go ahead. Keith. I was just going to say, it not only allows you to appreciate mastery, it allows you to appreciate minimalism, which exactly. also ends up being a kind of mastery, right? Like I am a, I'm a huge fan of the band, the meters, Listen oh, yeah. to the meters, right? A lot of their stuff is like unbelievably simple, yeah. But the genius mm -hmm. is in that simplicity that, like, a three piece, you know, maybe four piece band can make all this really funky, dope stuff and just <laughs> again have it sound really kind of basic without feeling the need to prove how amazing they are at playing their instruments, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and the thing that's interesting is like, I think as you mature in it, you, you appreciate both directions where it's like, you have one that's like the more complex kind of out there stuff. That's really hard to accomplish. Um, even okay. stuff that seems simple that like a master would have difficulty doing. Okay. Um, but you also like, you know, the more I've like experienced films and stuff like that, the more I appreciate a movie like legend of drunken master too, which I think is just a, a perfect Kung Fu movie that, that by no means is this like the highest art ever made, but it's like, I appreciate that more as I mature. Um, right. and, and I'm way more willing. Like if I were talking to people who were all they're mentioning is David Lynch and stuff like that, yeah. I would easily drop very proudly legend of drunken master two <laughs> as one of those top movies. Absolutely. It is, it is a great movie. And, and like, that's the thing that kind of happens with experience too, where you can like, uh, you know, get get to the point with music where you can also very proudly own the fact that, like, I don't know, I like Tom Jones. Like, I like Tom Jones music. It's horrible. I love right. it. I think it's great. I think it's well, masterfully I, horrible. Again, yeah. like for movie examples, yeah. like I, I was a huge fan of Roger Ebert, like so many people. He could be as snooty and intellectual as anybody. Yeah. Also worked with Russ Meyer. Yep. Also, you know, loved Jack, uh, Jackie Chan movies. Mm -hmm. Felt like Jackie Chan was basically our modern Charlie Chaplin. You know, like, I mean, it, so like, and it it teaches you that like, no, 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 you got to appreciate the thing for what it is and what it's trying yeah. to be. There He's is one of the few critics. Going. He's one of the few critics that gave Top Secret, which is one of the funniest movies ever made. He actually gave it a really positive review. And that, yeah. that movie got panned by so many people. But I love right. that about Ebert that he could look at something that's really stupid and silly and be like, that was its intention. It's a very yeah. effective at it. It <laughs> like, was effective. Like yeah. I thought it was funny. Yeah. Like, and, it, and, it, and funny isn't easy. Like there was yeah. craft that went into this. They were mm -hmm. like, and they executed and they accomplished it. And you know, it doesn't matter if it's low brow or not like whatever, whatever the weird kind of academic arbitrary critique is, you know, it's like, is it doing the thing it's trying to mm -hmm. do? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm actually reading a, a nonfiction book right now um, on Mad Max Fury Road. Yeah. Which I mean, I may have given this story before, but when I showed that, I, I told my kids, 
about it and we ended up watching it and yeah. then we watched the film and then they're like but it's this whole thing's just a car chase yes like, right exactly yes. yeah. yeah that's part of the genius that's, that's, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And, and then it's kind of that reductive stuff. like it would be can you imagine in fact maybe this has been done it's like if you did a martial arts movie that was basically one long fight you know, like that, that would, I mean, that sounds incredible, but you would, the skill that it would take to pull that off. I mean, yeah. that is a ridiculous cold shot. I think some people dismiss that movie as like, it's just a long car chase. It's like, think of the skill it takes. Yeah. To basically have that simple of an idea and extend that into a movie that is riveting for two yeah. hours. And like, I would very comfortably say one of the greatest action movies of all time if not the great, I don't know. Like, I mean, it's spectacular. It's the closest I can think from like Kung Fu would be um, uh, the raid, which like every movie after yeah. that that's done action has ripped off this premise. But the raid yeah. is like one of the first uh, Kung Fu action flicks where the premise is set up in like five seconds. At the beginning, you re realize this guy has a brother that's stuck at the top of the building. And yeah. he needs to meet his well, brother. And the whole movie like, is uh, just fighting. Uh, uh, to get to the top of the building and there is no uh, plot building whatsoever throughout it. It's just action nonstop. Um, and you're following them, you know, so it's like taking, um, yeah, like die hard and just taking out the plot and just being like, we're going to have 50,000 more fights. It's um, like a video just, game plot. Yeah. Well, and it makes me think of, you know, game, game of death, right. Yes. That was uh, Bruce Lee, you know, going up the, f and that to yeah. me, like, I remember when I saw that as a teenager, just like, Oh, this is Kung Fu for my Nintendo. Like this is, you know, a character fighting at like one level going up the stairs, now fighting another person going up the stairs. Like this is the, like it's, and the it's like, wow, oh, but it's kind of I I'm totally in. And I'm sitting here <laughs> watching this and it's like, this is cool. How's he gonna fight this guy? This guy has like a, a you know, oh, this guy's giant, or this guy's like a great judo guy, or whatever. Well, how's that gonna play yeah. out? And then yeah. you're sitting there and you're wondering, like, who's the next guy gonna? Like now they've done these two guys. Like who's the third guy? It's like it's yeah. it's great. It's fun. It it's one, that's actually one of my favorite, um, very not used subgenres of film. Basically, the I got to fight my way out of this, and that's the whole damn goddamn film, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Snowpiercer. Yeah, Snowpiercer. That was so good. Yeah, and yeah. and and the Warriors, which is essentially yep. that. Oh story. yes. You, you, I, if I if I say you know the raid. Snowpiercer, The Warriors, that's easily three of my top yeah. 10 films of all time, right? They're like, so fun. very that, respectable. That subgenre is yeah. so cool to me. You know, this whole, you're stuck here and the only way out is just kicking a whole lot of ass. Yep. Well, that's part of why, I mean, there's, I, there are, I could do a whole three hours just sharing my love for Raiders of the Lost Ark. But yeah. Raiders of the Lost Ark, when you rewatch it, it is basically a continuous action sequence. Mm -hmm. Like there, once you get out of the opening with like the idol and all that, and then college, and then he go, once he's officially like, okay, he's looking for the arc. It, it just does not, it's just yeah. the gas pedal being like push, 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 mm -hmm. push, push, push. And mm -hmm. it is one thing leading to the other, leading to the other. I mean, yeah. it kind of is in that family of action films where it's like, we're on a train now. Like yep. this is mm -hmm. like, this is just hurtling forward. And, and it's going to end when he gets to the destination. That's it. Also, Damn. Harrison Ford's The Fugitive. That is another one. Oh, that's a oh. great one. Oh, my gosh. It does, yeah. it so good. Like, so it good. Like, yeah. That was a great so, one. Um, I, I didn't kill my wife. I don't care. I don't I mean, care. Yeah. 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 Movie. Dee Dee Tommy Lee, Lee Jones, by the way, it. like, really, like, that's what I, like, it's a great movie anyway, but Tommy Lee Jones kind of elevates that movie to like, okay, now this is really interesting. Oh, yeah. And I like, especially from the writer of D versus M perspective, a character that's kind of like, you're just, uh, he's going to be, he's a little complicated. You're going to have yeah. to just accept him, you know, like, but I, what are you going to think about him? How are you going to feel from him about him scene to scene? I don't know. I'm not going to make it easy on you though. It's, I love yeah. that. Um, Dee Dee mentioned Bullet, uh, which uh, as for, w while we were talking about chases, and of course you have to mention Bullet. That's one Steve of the first chases. Like, yeah. yeah, so good. Yeah. Oh, the French Connection, really good car chase. Also too. fantastic chase, which I, if I remember right, they didn't have all the right approvals and permissions to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a very, like, they, they were 
being very dangerous when they did the French Connection chase, I guess. They were yeah. really cutting, literally and figuratively cutting some corners. But, um, I, I apologize. I do love that. To hop off in a second, so... Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, am, I appreciate. I am. Well, I appreciated you hopping in, and uh, and I. Yeah, man. Uh, sorry, it took Thanks. me a little while to get caught up and let people in. But. Well, those were those were big books. I yeah. <laughs> they were. They especially were the one. Especially the one. Yeah, so anyway, so it. thanks for having me, gentlemen. I will uh, hop off and see you somewhere. All right. Hey, Keith, Anytime. Keith, yeah. Keith, Keith, where can people uh, check out your stuff oh, yes, and all yes. that stuff? Oh, oh sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My so my my name is my website basically keithrfoster.com. I got all kinds of stuff there. Um, and something I'm trying to talk about more and more is like sign up for my mailing list. Cause I'm about to really upgrade my mailing list. You know, before so far I've been doing like once every three or four months when something's coming out. Um, but now what I want to do is I actually want to put some articles and fun things on there so that it can be more of like actually an engaging thing. Right. Instead of just here's stuff I have coming up. So thoughts, you yeah. know, maybe it's reviews, maybe it's, it's exclusive stuff to a story. So anyway, it's right there on keithrfoster.com. And as you can see in my right there, I'm writing a comic that's, that you can pre-order right now, Animals. That is the diamond code that's been staring at you all day. So you can- I was wondering that. what that was. Yeah. No, that's like exciting. Eight, 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 order, order this. Yeah, order this. Okay. Um, Excellent. Dude. Excellent. I'm very excited to uh, read Animals. So cool. Yeah, man. Thank okay. You. All right. Have a good day. Very cool. All right. <sighs> so- Sweet. Congrats, Gary, getting there. Thank you. That's Thank you. Insane. It's been a journey. Yeah. yeah. How do you feel at this point about it? Um, Being, you know, at that point. It's always, you know, it's weird how it's always different. I don't know if you've had the same experience where. Each. And I'm still, you know, I'm still tidying up. Like, it'll be another month, probably, before I'm, like, I can say, like, I'm done, done, done. You know, like, it's out. It's available to buy. Like, that's it, you know. Um, but it's close. And it's it's interesting to me. I, you know, it, it, I don't know. It's not a, it's, I, I don't know how to elaborate on this thought, but it's just, it's how it's always different. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's never, you know, you, I went through 75 and like, okay, so that's what this is. Now we'll do 97. And that felt totally different. It was yeah. a whole different process. It felt totally different. Doing it was different. Getting it out was different. Like it just didn't feel like 75. And it's like, okay, well now I've got it. Now I've got a sense of what this thing is. Now let's do the next one. And that also mm -hmm. is totally different. Um, I think you certainly can appreciate this. Uh, there is something about these long-term projects, especially, I think any kind of creative work, but especially something where you're with it for a long time mm -hmm. and it requires a lot of sacrifice and, um, dedication and just continued pressure like you applying pressure on the problem and the problem applying pressure on you you yeah. know like this kind of this you're in this kind of i don't want to overly dramatize it by saying like you're in this kind of death struggle with it but like you are grappling with this thing yeah and it is costing you energy for months maybe years um and i think the one thing I can say will absolutely happen if you do this, if you do something like this, is you're going to learn a lot about yourself. Yes. And that's something that probably we don't talk about a lot in these videos, in our casters, and like, because it's not, I, you just assume like, well, that can't be too interesting to the audience. But on this side of the screen, it is the vast... Um, it's the vastest aspect of the experience. Yeah. It's like your relationship with this process and what it tells you about yourself and how, how, what it's like to live that long inward, mm -hmm. you know, like, which on some level that's creating 
is you kind of turning all the lenses in, which is a very fraught and difficult thing uh, to do for months at a time, you know? And yeah. what do you learn about yourself going through this? And not even to touch on, you have this idea of what you think your story is about. You do it, you look and you say like, yeah, it is about that. But it's also a little bit about, this, and it's also a little bit about that. Oh, I did. Oh, the recurring theme in these that I hadn't really, I didn't wasn't a recur. I didn't intend this to be a recurring theme or whatever. You know, you just. I I think it's it's a. It's a it's a it is very much a personal journey, and it is very much a discovery of the self and i know that sounds very foo-foo but i mean that's kind of i i don't know how else to describe it i don't know what do you have a about no i i think i get it sorry my dogs are kind of no, that's fine. um i think that you're i don't know how much this is coming through without the dogs um no i i, I hear you okay so i think that one of the core things um with that is it, it i do think the death struggle kind of thing is probably part of it. It, yeah. it, it as as hyperbolic as that is it's like yeah. i do think it's very much like wrestling a bear for yeah. a year where you're like yeah. learning things about yourself your capabilities and the fact that you're able to overcome a giant goal or yeah. struggle i mean people compare it to marathons or something like that but i'd imagine right. marathon runners having a similar feeling probably completed a giant thing because it's like it's going to cost you something to get there. And, and it's, a, you arrive, it's a, a struggle with the self. Yeah. Like the actual putting one foot in front of the other isn't as hard as yes. the willing yourself to do it. And yeah. that I think is where you, you learn and you, you end up discovering on the pro side where your strengths are, what you're good at. You surprise yourself in ways. You please yourself in ways. You also do stumble across all the ways that you're not as strong, yeah. or not, you know, or 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 fragile, or or delicate, you know, whatever. Like, you know, I mean, it it is very much. It's there's a quote I think about a lot. I wish I remember who. Did. I think it was Shackleton, but I I went through a period where I was very interested in polar the the golden age of polar exploration. Nice, which is all and fiction. Uh, all fiction, all fake. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Southern Hemisphere uh, doesn't even exist. I can't believe I got bamboozled in that way. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. What was the thing they use? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, that's not part of our Atmos, okay? It's not uh, part of the Atmos. Yes, right. Anyway, I was super interested in that because it's, I'm just, you know, it's just a fascinating era. Like this, that golden age of like discovery where people are trying to I can understand. find the center of the Amazon or trying to. What's yeah, up? they were kind of insane too. I mean, like, I, people, and, yeah, it it wasn't like this mapped out thing. It's like it was pretty common ooh. for like a weird English gentleman to be like, "I'm going to go to the polar uh, regions yes. and explore, and then just die and, and like, die, or half the people die, or whatever." Away. Yeah, and then they come home and they get over their malaria uh, and they put some weight back on and whatever, and it's like, "Well, let's try again next year." Yeah, you know, it's. it's what are you doing? But no, I, I was kind of, it's yeah, a really yeah. interesting thing. But I think it was Shackleton who said this. I could be wrong. It was one of the captains of one of these expeditions who would tell people when they would sign up. I've used this quote before in some of my videos, but it's just a quote that I think of all the time. If you are in any way false, this ship will find you out. You know, like, so this idea of being like, wherever you are not at a hundred percent going through this experience is going to reveal it. Yep. If you, even if you're not even aware of it right now, we're going to find out, we're all going to find out when we're on this boat together. This is where you fall short. This yep. is where you are weak. This is where you are fragile. This is where you can't hang. This is where, you know, whatever. And, and likewise, this is where you meet the moment. This is mm -hmm. where you are unusually courageous. This is where you are steady. This is where you are funny. This is where you're a piece of shit. This is where you can be small. This is where you can be withdrawn. You know, it's like this experience is going to reveal all of that mm -hmm. in you. I feel very strongly, as does something like this. 
Like this, will, and like as you're, pro I'm sure, finding out with uh, Not Death But Love, and like, you know, all of these, like you just start to realize like, okay, I'm learning about myself in a very uh, merciless way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like this is, here you are, here's the mirror. The, the more so that's, these, I think, I'm at the stage where yeah. I'm thinking about that. And the more of these you do, the more like it's hard to take seriously a cartoonist who will not finish a project because it's yeah. like you just haven't tested your metal. It's like you're saying you're right. an explorer, but you haven't been to the polar regions. Like it's like once right. you go there, you, then you'll know. Then you'll know your strengths, your weaknesses. Right. Um, and it's funny, the more you do of these, you're right. It's different every time. Um, and it is fascinating how it continues to hold my interest. I'm imagining yeah you're going to be fascinated by taking on the next one because this yeah. one was so different. And each time afterwards, I'm sure the thought does cross the mind of like, should I do another one of these explorations? Cause they cost a lot to do. They like, cost a cost, lot. Yeah. It costs a lot of time, resources, energy, emotions. Um, well, the question I have like right now, this would be the time to be having it. And I feel like this is, this is consistent with the past ones. Um, I know it will eventually come back, this urge to do it, mm -hmm. uh, to do this again. But right now it's hard to imagine. Oh, I yeah. mean, and, and, and the, the childbirth thing is a very well-trodden comparison, but it's the best one. It's like, I mean, if you ask someone six weeks after they've had a baby, like, so are you going to have another? Like, prepare <laughs> to be punched in the face. Yeah. But like, you know, if you like it takes some time to kind of regather all your reserves to even want to think about yeah. that. It takes a while for um, us to get delusional enough to, to do another one. Yeah, that's right. Right. And so I, but for example, even though right now I've been telling people, I've made it very clear. I do not intend to be drawing the next one this year. I intend to probably take the rest of the year off from drawing. Um, I would like to write the next script this year. I would like to maybe even get as far as page planning and, yeah. and you know, all of that, but I don't, there's going to be no like drawing page one this year. Like I'm taking the rest of the year off for mental health. I want to, as I've talked about often, I want to catch, I want to play some risk. I want to play some video games. I want to watch a bunch of movies. I want to read some books, but that said, I've already bought, I've got a pile of books over here. Uh, that are research for the next one. I've already right. bought them, like, so start reading. And there's a trip, uh, D versus M's generally take place in Arizona and real world locations are usually at least referenced. Yeah. The next one is a very specific location. And I've already looked into like planning a trip to go there to kind of scout it out and take hundreds of photos just so I have a good feel of like mm -hmm. what that place looks like. So e as exhausted as I am right now, and just uh, as much as the idea of starting another one drawing wise sounds horrible, uh, I know it'll come. Yeah. Like I know it eventually. So it's like, I might as well just start getting my ducks in a row and, and expect that. So the question I have is it, cause I do kind of think it's, it, I mean, there's so many analogies that come up whenever you finish a big challenge, right? But yeah. it's like you're kind of at that phase where you've harvested your crop <laughs> and now, yes. now it's like kind of spreading seeds again. And then you're like, am I really going to go through the threshing and all the craziness of like, yeah. of like this farm nonsense, like again, yeah. and that season will come. But it's like at this point, it sounds like you're kind of scattering, like at the point of yeah. scatter some seeds, like maybe we'll give it a little water and see where that kind of goes. Yeah. Down. And um, just kind of like. I just trust that by the time this yeah. actually is ready to harvest, yeah, I will be ready to do it. Like yeah. now I'm not, but no. I need to think <laughs> ahead, you know? Yeah. And I, but you know, congrats at getting through the whole thing. Like it, it's, yeah. this is the, the kind of fun part. And, but, but I guess what I was going to say that I think is an interesting question too, is have you yet experienced the strange sorrow of finishing a project? That kind of comes to twinges, twinges. Yes, um, but not fully yet because I have enough. Like as in the outside of outset of this video, I yeah. listed like the things that I still need to do. It's just enough, you know, where it's like I don't like Mary. Uh, Mary asked me, uh, I don't know, a few days ago. 
how does it feel like are you thinking about like how people are going to react to it and i was like I'm, that's so far like that's yeah. still like, i'm still kind of in the zone where yeah. i haven't i haven't even backed up enough like i it hasn't even fully sunk in that i'm done yeah you know in like with the hard part there's still things to do but I, that's so that will hit and again each one of these experiences are different <laughs> but based on the past two that will hit when i see the physical proof when comics wellspring sends me the proof mm -hmm. of 79 to look over before i approve the order that's when it all like like first of all the relief the feeling of like pride the feeling of like i did i can't like it's real now i can't believe it this thing mm -hmm. that i've just been drawing for so long now it's a thing and like people are going to be able to get this and all i have to do now is email comics wellspring and say like yeah go ahead proceed and you know and in a week or whatever i'll get like a box of that's when it usually hits me that's when usually i have the highest high of this is what i'm in it for like this is a great feeling but also all that thought of like Oh shit! Now everyone's gonna be reading this. I'm like, what are they? <laughs> you know, like, yeah, like it's gonna be out. Like I now, it's like it's it's there's like that's the next stop is people yeah. reading. You know. Well, it's, well, it's 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 exciting that you've gotten here. Uh, it's been fun kind of seeing the whole process along the way. I'm glad the live streams are back. I hope that some of those streams. Uh, might end up being risk streams in the end. Oh, I'm I, uh, I I I think we do definitely need to finally arrange a game. But yeah. I am anxious because you've clearly gotten in a lot more practice of late. I can't even tell you the last time I played a. Well, no, I did play a couple games in the app, but then I was like, ah, I got to focus on you know finishing this book. Yeah. So I I didn't really like I wasn't too. But in terms of like how let's say like the past 10 years, how many games have each of us played? You've probably played, I don't know, 50? How many games have you played on that app? I don't, I I don't have know. no idea. At this yeah, point. there's got to be a count. On <laughs> I don't yeah, know, I'm a lot. about one a day, so yeah. Yeah, so, and meanwhile, if you look at how many risk games have I played in the past 10 years, mm -hmm. I would guess five. <laughs> you well, you, know, might, something you like, might have beginner's advantage. You know, I might, I might. And I do have all sorts of, intelligence advantages in That's terms true. of when i mean like chinese spy balloon advantages where i've been watching you play mm -hmm. i see i feel like i see the weaknesses. patterns i yeah. feel like i see like preferences like mm -hmm. things you tend to do over and over it's like just school like it's like okay duly noted interesting mm -hmm. uh you know i don't will that help me i don't know i don't know but at least i i have at least i feel like i have a good academic yeah a briefing on Josh as a risk player, you know, where I it's like, like okay, it. I understand. But in the same way, for it, but here's where it might be meaningless. I've seen a lot of Muhammad Ali fights. I have a good <laughs> feel for how Muhammad Ali fights or how Mike Tyson fights. I, I have a pretty good idea of how he fights. Would that help me if I step in the ring with him? Not necessarily. No, almost certainly not. But, uh, but I have a feel. I have a feel okay. what to expect. That's awesome. I'm excited about it. I have to go eat lunch. Okay. But uh, yeah. thank you for having me on. Thank yeah. you for and being here. Yeah. Yes. And then awesome. uh, let's see. That's two hours. So what? Please, uh, anything you'd like to pitch, promote? JoshuaKemble.com. Uh, Joshua Kemble on YouTube. Um, two Stories and Jacob's Apartment are two excellent graphic novels that uh, I I am very proud of. They took about half a decade each to make uh, that I wrote and illustrated. So. Go pick up a copy of Jacob's Apartment or Two Stories. And uh, aside from that, um, if you enjoy these live streams with Gary, check out my live streams throughout the week. And uh, also, congrats to Gary. And you guys should be uh, chomping at the bit to get the next Dinosaurs versus Mars bots because they're incredible books. I should say D versus M. But they're incredible books. And you guys should uh, be supporting Gary and all that he does. I'm sure since you're watching this, you're already doing that. But if you guys are on the fence, you've been watching Gary and you haven't read his books, what are you doing? These are incredible books. Um, and so, yeah, there you go. Thank you so much. I appreciate Bye, guys. It. Are you going to be streaming today? Um, I might be a little later on, but we'll, okay. we'll have to see. Because uh, I have I'll like roughs and stuff to do. So it might be kind of fun. And uh, I'll probably, if anything, be doing research, which can be really fun on... Um, 
on the live streams because it's a collective effort. So yeah, yeah. I'll be fiddling with, I, th I think I, it's attainable for me to finish the cover for 79 today. So I think that's my modest goal. So. Hell yeah, you can make it happen. And the cover will be fun after having to do so many sequential pages. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's plus it, yeah, with the D versus M covers, it's very kind of graphic designy. Yeah. It's a totally different kind of thing to mess with. It's It'll be nice. Yeah. That's awesome. So. Well, congrats right. again on getting there. Uh, we're all rooting for you. So cool. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Bye, guys. See you next time. And I will see all of you next time. Uh, I think, let me make sure before I commit to it, let me see what my next Saturday looks like. Yes. OK, so there is a live stream next Saturday, a week from today. And in fact, uh, there'll be a returning guest Lori Kalfatera, she, um, Path of the Pale Rider, she has a Kickstarter going. It's going very well, but every little bit counts. She will be kind of very much toward the tail end of the Kickstarter. So it'll be the last opportunity to get in there and uh, pitch in and help support her latest book, which she writes. Um, it's a very fun comic. I'm very excited for it. She's a great guest. It'll be fun to talk to her. I have no idea what we're going to talk. I haven't even, I'm, I build the track right in front of the train as it's moving. I haven't really even thought about what I would like to talk to Lori about next week, but I will be talking to Lori. So look forward to that. Um, maybe I'll catch you on a live stream. Otherwise, uh, keep an eye on my Instagram for updates on how the book is going. Something I didn't mention today, but will be coming. Uh, is a trailer for Divas M 1979. But that's once I get all the actual pages, like all the stuff, the covers and all that stuff done for 79. Once that's all done and I'm ready to place a print order, then I will be cutting together a trailer. Uh, so also some something to look forward to this month. In terms of, obviously I can't commit to a specific date yet, but in terms of when will Divas M 1979 be on sale, Based on where I am in the process, based on how long printing takes, all of that, I'm assuming probably around the end of this month. But we'll see. Something like that. You will be the second to know after me. I will talk to you next week. Uh, take care and good luck on whatever your individual projects are. <laughs>